We got a robbery. There was a flood in Nevada in the high desert. We go, that doesn't make sense. Then we had another group that drilled into a closed off underground working and flooded one half of the mine. And unfortunately, we didn't make guidance and the market does what it always does when you miss guidance. It was very painful. We, we went up and then we went down and then we stayed down. And now it's, it's turned around. Hi, this is Eric Mashinsky, and welcome back. This is our second part uh, of an interview with Rob McGuin from McGuin Mining of what I thought was just incredible content. So fast forward then to when was the time when you divested Gold Corp? What did that look like financially for shareholders during that whole uh, you know couple of decade period or so? Uh, in terms of returns and then also for yourself. And then uh, what was the next step, which I do know it, what it is, and that is the, uh, the formation of U.S. coal. I question a lot of the corporate governance um, mandates that were coming out. And I found my board becoming more and more focused on compliance with the regulations. I didn't have an argument with the regulations. I had an argument with the application of them. Um, I looked at prospectuses and went, how do you have 15 pages of risk factors? How do you have 300 pages of documentation? Give the shareholder a chance. I mean, it comes through the mail. I said, where does it mainly go? Garbage can. It, it's, it's an expensive and uh, confusing period. And why can't we make write prospectuses in plain English rather than terms that defy a lot of people's knowledge of um, and take a long time to get to the point? So I just found the board getting more and more caught up. We'd won awards uh, for our financial disclosure. We'd won awards for our, dis our other disclosure. But I just felt the board was getting somewhat paralyzed by lawyers saying you can't do this or you can't do that. I mean, I wanted to advertise on the radio for the traffic news and uh, our lawyers went, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, well, the Ontario Securities Commission won't allow it. I said, is there a rule? No, it's just a feeling they won't allow it. And I said, well, I'm not telling them anything that's untrue. Um, why would they have a problem with that? Oh, they would. And I said, all right, I've listened to your advice, but I'm going ahead. I'm going to advertise. And so on the evening traffic news report, there would be a story of Nad from Golden Corp. And there were one or two complaints that went into the Ontario Securities Commission. And the commission said, have you said anything wrong, anything that's false? No. Well, there's no problem. <laughs> And so often there are areas where people have just created these barriers, but that's what it's like. I mean, I'll go back to the strike for a moment. When the strike occurred, I went up to the mine site and I sat down, my mine manager and all the department heads, and I said, let's talk about the mine of the future. Okay, what, what do we need to do differently from what, we're doing, what we'd been doing before the strike. And I asked the manager to go up to the front of the room. There was a whiteboard, and I said, just write these thoughts down, point one, point two. He gets to the third point, he turns around, and he says, Rob, the union's not going to accept this. And everybody in the room nodded their head in agreement. I said, this is our mind. We're looking at the future. It's going to be benefiting both of them. Is it, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> so six months into the strike, um, the manager goes, this is different. We haven't gone this long before in a strike. Um, what do you want to do? And I said, <laughs> well, Dennis, it's like this. I'd call him up every week, and I'd be up at the mine every quarter. I said, guys, this is what we want to do in the future. Um, and Dennis finally said, I think I get it. 
So good. Now get your department heads together. It took another six months, and then all of a sudden, they realized that they had also constructed this barrier in their mind that wasn't real. It was an assumption that that was. So then, after that, they just started doing things they thought they couldn't do before. And they were innovating underground and taking steps they hadn't taken before. And it was the freedom of their thinking. But it had been clouded by the perception that someone would not allow. So, I guess you asked a question earlier on what drove me or caused me to think. It's looking at regulations, looking at situations and saying, well, what's the real question here? What is the problem? Is there an alternative? And the, the Gold Corp challenge, um, I'd say you're in an industry and many industries, they have their own language, they have their own foundation stones and beliefs. And in the mining industry it was, you never give away your geological data without a confidentiality agreement. Um, someone might take you over otherwise, someone might buy all the ground around you. And I said, well, take a look in the broad market, is that what's going on? when? I had multiple voting shares in two levels of companies as I was compressing. Um, and maybe that gave me some freedom as well uh, to do things. But I said, well, let's get rid of them. And people said, well, aren't you afraid someone's going to take you over? And I said, well, there's a couple of companies out there, many companies out there that have no, you know, special voting shares and they're not taken over. And if they're going to take us over, You've got options, and they're going to have to pay a premium. Uh, so you're going to benefit. And if you're associated with this big discovery, it's going to help your career. Um, but it's, and the Gold Corp challenge came out of two questions um, and one situation. Our engineers came along and said, we're going to build a plant of this size, a new plant, to handle the ore we've just found. And I went, well, why only that size? Well, that's all the ore we found. I said, but we've been adding to our resources 30% a year for the last three, four years. Is there any reason to think we're not going to be adding it again? So I went to our head of exploration and said, how big is this deposit we'll get? And he went, I don't know. It was a <laughs> bad answer. Then, <laughs> how long is it going to take you to find out? I don't know. <laughs> Another bad answer. And that was really the genesis of why I went to the world to ask the world to tell me if I could, it, was there other expertise out there that you could access? Um, there are other greenstone belts or geological settings similar to ours. Maybe people look at that differently than we do. So, as I said, there was math, there was computer graphics, there was even people coming in with organic solutions to what is considered an inorganic problem. Um, so you had this just incredible diversity and so are there alternatives? I guess that would be my quest when looking at a situation are there alternatives that haven't been considered or maybe consider they've been considered somewhere else and I haven't seen it because I'm looking there um, and I think it's seeking the alternatives that are um, yeah, it's uh, it's also um, not getting distracted by so many of the, whether you want to call them false flags, or I think as you said, this cloud or veil that all these things in life that just get put in front of us and we think, oh, I got to go in the other direction. Instead of pausing and thinking, this could easily be overcome, or maybe it can't, but I'm going to check it out. And then perhaps that leads to actually a breakthrough. And you've had that happen time and time again. And it's Interestingly ironic, I guess, for me to hear this coming from somebody in the gold business where we have this fundamental belief about uh, the debasement of our fiat currencies by governments protecting ourselves with something like gold. And frankly, what you did at Gold Corp with the challenge, Rob, you and I had a discussion probably back in 2018 or 19 at Beaver Creek about Bitcoin. And I remember that. And, and, uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if I would have known a bit more about how that process worked for you, I simply would have said, 
instead of whatever I did say about why I liked Bitcoin, it would have been, Rob, Bitcoin is what you did with the Gold Corp Challenge for money. It's an open source, right? Uh, and you did it first. Um, and this is what came out of it. And, you know, so it's this decentralized sort of power. And um, it flipped the entire model on its head in an industry that has been around since the beginning of time. Uh, yes. Right. So that is another incredible component. And um, so then you you end up actually divesting gold. Pool. And when was that? That was um, 2005. As I said, I felt like I was in a fenced in field. Uh, these regulations and the board, not not I had good board members, but I just thought they were being blinded. Um, and it was like I was a bull and the red flags being held and I was charging at them and I said you know one I don't like doing this always questioning how we go about it or at least the frequency I was doing it then and I said I think it's time to leave um, so I told it to the board and then I saw a situation um, which I thought was undervalued um, and I approached them and said, let's get together. And I uh, approached the people that were running Wheaton River, and I said, um, I'd like to merge the two companies. I'm stepping out of the picture. You guys can run the company. Uh, we have $400 million in cash. We have no debt, and we're a very low gold producer, cost gold producer, and when we put the two companies together, we have a shot at getting to two million ounces a year, a few years down the road in terms of production. Um, we'll be one of the lowest cost gold producers in the world. We'll become, we'll move from intermediate to uh, major player. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, that's good. My, my bank account had grown. Um, and I go off to do something else. I hadn't really thought what I was going to do next, but I just thought, well, the company was in good shape and uh, our shareholders should do well. And it, it went up from there. Um, I, and so I, I was looking around and I said, okay, what am I going to do? And while I was at Gold Corp, I invested uh, for the corporation in a number of junior companies. And those investments helped us finance the development of Red Lake when we tore it down and built a new shaft in that. Um, so I said, well, I'll, I'll just keep investing in juniors just for my, myself this time. Um, there were a couple of companies that I had in Gold Corp and I said, well, I'll buy them from the company at market price. I left one or two in there that I, I sort of kicked myself. Uh, one was a Orion, an Ecuadorian play, I bought it at a dollar, it got taken out at 40, and I thought, <laughs> well, that was a dumb one to leave behind. <laughs> um, and then I bought into, uh, while running Gold Corp, um, Rothschilds came along and said, would you like to buy um, Rio Tinto's interest in Cortez Hills? That was, they had a 40% interest, and Placer had a 60% interest. Um, and that introduced me to the, the size of the deposits down there. And so then I bought into a little company called U.S. Gold that owned the property immediately to the south of Cortez. Um, and they hadn't done a lot of deep exploration. And I thought, well, there's probably a story there. And they had, yeah, I don't know, close to 2 million ounces outlined. They were uh, refractory ore. So I bought that. And then there were some other companies around it and ended up making a bid for four companies um, to create U.S. Gold. Um, bought into U.S. Gold um, in August of '05. I think I bought about a 30% interest for, it was at 36 cents a share, and <laughs> seven months later, we were doing an issue at 450, and it ran up to $10. And I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, uh, we haven't drilled a hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had the shine on you at that time. I, that was when I first heard your name is because I had just started to get into the gold sector. 
as an uh, alternative investment advisor and taking positions and in investing myself. And I remember UXG and I thought, what the heck is going on with this thing? And I remember looking at the boards and all that. And it was like Rob McGue and Rob McGue and Gold Corp. He did this, he did that. And now he's doing this. And so I looked at it and I, I was very intrigued, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to chase a stock from uh, 50 cents to 10 bucks uh, that goes up that fast. It was really a big run. And, but it was right on the front of my radar. And then as things cooled off, I started to become a shareholder of UXG. Now you, so it sounds like there was a string that was directly there and already sort of like a plate set where you said, okay, I'm going to, I've had this big, huge run, this great run at Gold Corp. It's getting too bureaucratic, if you will, for me. And I think, you know, I'm going to take a step back and take a break. But, you know, your bloodline is still rushing into this area. And, you know, that keeps our heart beating, I think, probably for both of us with uh, playing in the game. And you had these assets that you already had interest in and think, okay, you know, next next chapter. Did you take any break? like for yourself at all during that time? Or was it more like, right, let's keep rolling? Uh, pretty much keep rolling. Okay, and you were in your 50s at that time? Yes. Yeah, so let's look at uh, U.S. Gold um, ended up, uh, if I recall correctly, you had, a, uh, you had it under that name and that brand, so from about 2006 or so until... Uh, 11 or 12 was it yeah it, it, right up to the end of 11 in um january 2012 McEwen mining came into being one with, of my best friends from uh college i remember you know he we had, he had been on the institutional side and i was on the you know high net worth retail side and um we remember we followed you closely and i had been a shareholder and uh you know, the, the market. So I launched the gold investment letter in, I believe it was October of 11, which was the top month yes. of the bull market. And then you changed the name to McEwen Mining. And my friend Jeremy said, uh, that's like the Time Magazine cover. Uh, somebody like Rob changing the name of the company to his own, like a kiss of death sort of thing, you know, for the industry, right? So he had a point, I guess, looking back on it, because then all of a sudden we went into this grueling four year plus year bear market that, you know, I had to cut my teeth in to build the letter, which was probably a massive blessing in disguise, by the way. But I believe you personally, through your years, I mean, decades at Gold Corp and then also at McEwen, US Gold and McEwen Mighty, you got used to being an outperformer to the market, right? Obviously, yes. Yes. and always an outperforming stock. If you want to outperform GDXJ, tag along with Rob where he is, and you've got it in the bank. And then fast forward to, we have that 2016 high, um, and coming out of that area, he ran into some real challenges, right? I mean, some crazy stuff that I remember hearing stories about, things that were just kind of going left for some of your operations. The the, t the operation in Timmins and, and other things that, you know, you were you were building up and you had acquired. You come into some real headwinds uh, with the company operationally for about, what, at least two years. Maybe it lasted closer to three. What happened during that time and, and how tough was that? Um, there were some people I hired that uh, to run operations that... They didn't perform as I expected. Um, they gave me guidance that I gave to the market. And unfortunately, we didn't make guidance. And the market does what it always does when you miss guidance. Um, and there was a string of that. Um, we bought into Timmins in 17, October of 2017. It was, uh, someone had spent a lot of money on it previous owner. Uh, it was a difficult mine, uh, high cost. I liked it because it was in Timmins, a big gold camp, it had some nice high grade at the bottom, isolated bits. Um, but they had problems working and actually it went a little bit longer than that. It went um, in through the early 20s. Um, and it was just misguidance. I mean, I, I liken that period to an image. It's a very nasty image, but it's 
off the coast, the east coast of Canada, the province of Newfoundland. And on the north end of Newfoundland, you have this ice in the, the spring and all these little baby harp seals come out. The fishermen in Newfoundland used to go harvest them and they had clubs and I felt like one of those harp seals for <laughs> a few years. I just, I just thought, wow, did this ever go the other way? Um, and uh, it's stabilized now. Um, and we had a big copper project too that it was cash hungry and you could only operate you're only in there during the, the summer months, really, and a little bit of the spring and the fall. Um, so you couldn't get a good drilling season going. Um, and I thought, this is a big asset for us. We've got to work. Um, we've got these, we've got a mine in Nevada that got built and it didn't work the way it was supposed to. There was a mine in Timmins that wasn't, it was high cost and struggling. El Gallo in Mexico was kind of... El Gallo was starting to work and then it stopped. It, right. We, we got a robbery. We, there was a flood in Nevada in the high desert. And go, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> How do you get a flood in a desert? <laughs> well, you've got to tell about the, the guys that left for lunch by the conveyor belt <laughs> fire. Uh, well, there, there's this crusher and it has a couple of conveyor belts in it and uh, minus 40 or something and these guys are working at the belt isn't working and it's not as pliable so they figure <laughs> well we'll warm it up and they warm it up they get a blowtorch or two and put it under the belt to make it softer and then they decide well it's time for dinner <laughs> and they go into dinner leaving these blowtorches going <laughs> and when they come out there's this huge crusher's on fire and melts it. Um, well, then we had another group that drilled into a closed off underground working and that acted was a dam for a big reservoir of water above them and flooded one half of the mine. And you go, how do these things happen? I mean, who would leave a blowtorch on a, on a piece of rubber? Who would drill through there if you have knowledge of all the underground workings? Well, I found out I had a lot of them in my employ. <laughs> it was very painful. We, we went up, and then we went down, and then we stayed down. Um, and now it's, it's turned around. I mean, the last, since the summer of 22, we've had a pretty good performance, um, outperforming the Dow, the NASDAQ copper, gold, and a lot of the GDX, GDXJ. And that was being not driven by gold, that was being driven, I think, by our copper project, where suddenly people are going, oh yeah, this is big. And we, you know, Rio Tinto came in and made three investments in it, the second largest mining company in the world. And we had Stellantis, the fourth largest car manufacturer in the world, buying into the project. Uh, the first time an auto manufacturer bought into a copper deposit. Um, and that's so, in Argentina, Los Azules, uh, I believe the ninth largest undeveloped copper asset in the world, correct? Yes. And it, it's um, multi-generational. I, I was just in Argentina, came back this Sunday, past Sunday. Um, they have a new president. He is very much a libertarian. He was brandishing a chainsaw at his political rally saying yep. I'm going to cut out the bureaucracy and I said I almost got off the plane with a chainsaw too and I'll, I'll help you <laughs> <laughs> then um, and Argentina is starting to shift I mean it was sort of not a place where a lot of people wanted to put any money at all inflation and governments but we've seen this new president making statements about and he's He's reduced the number of government ministries in half, cut it in half. He's fired all sorts of people in ministries that didn't need. He's trying to open up the market for foreign investment. We saw in the last two weeks, Tech, a big base metal producer, said it's going to invest in a junior company. Only about 20 million, nothing really large. 
but the uh, Chamber of Hydrocarbons have said um, if the exchange controls come off, as the president said he wants to, they're prepared to put in, make an investment of $15 billion a year for a number of years going forward to help develop the oil and gas reserves of the country. Um, the IMF said they've just um, given him another $4.7 billion. Um, so you got a, a new president, a new governor. I met with the Minister of Mines for the nation, for the province, the governor of the province, the Minister of the Environment. They're all, let's get this show on the road. Let's get mining moving. Uh, we know it could help our export revenue and reduce our import uh, issues and address our balance of trade. Um, so there's a lot of positive things happening. I don't know if they'll be able to, oh, and the, the Chamber of Deputies, the first phase of a government passage of a bill um, have approved the omnibus bill largely intact that the new president is putting forward. I think he had some, over 300 changes he won is in this omnibus bill, the way the government's going. So I think that'll move along. And the prospects for copper, I mean, we were up almost to $5 and now we're, what, 380 or 370. Uh, but the prospects still look good. And our precious metal operations met guidance this year yep. uh, for 23. Um, generating positive cash flow, which is nice. And we got a couple of growth projects there. So, And I'm just going to disclose now, I am a significant shareholder in both McGew and Mining and then also directly in McGew and Copper, uh, which when was that when we when you put in 40 million and then raised another over 40? That was in, it started that raise in 21 or two? In 21, and we closed in August or September 22. So I'm going to read something to you that just came in last night on time. I had put out a very brief gold investment letter update on YouTube. Rick Rule just finished a, a great interview with him. And I've got Rob McGowan. You know, these guys are titans of legends of the industry. We're doing that tomorrow. So stay tuned. It's going to be good. That's all I pretty much said. And we have a troll on uh, that video. And here's what he said to us, which is, Eric, nice of you to think of Rob McGowan as a legend. But Gold Corp was years and years ago. Since then, he has been horrible and Mux has been a disaster. So what has he done in the last five to six years? Please help me understand. And what I ended up responding was, oh, he has just morphed into billionaire territory and moved just the McGew and Copper division of Mux from a $257 million valuation to over $800 million in the last two five years. That's validated by Rio Tinto and Soantis, the fourth largest car company in the world, having invested a couple of hundred million dollars combined at ever increasing share prices. That's all. But maybe he's a schmuck like you, Ray, <laughs> like you suggest. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> what do you say to a guy like that? Right. What do you say? Like, what have you done in the last five to six years? Uh, does he, you know, this to what I look for as the as the interesting part of the answer is, what made you dig deep during those headwinds where you could have just been like, I'm done with this. I've you've got enough money for everything, you don't need to worry about that stuff. To me, the biggest thing that I've seen in what has Rob done the last five to six years, it's not even some of those details of what you pushed through and have produced. It's the fact that you decided to do it, and how did you do that on a daily basis when you're waking up every morning looking at problems? Well, I could certainly sympathize with his comments. Um, I, it, there was a period in there, uh, there were a lot of people who'd come in on the basis of what I'd done before, and it was very, yeah, it, it, it was hard to see people losing money there. Um, and, but I could see a way of getting through it. It just took a lot longer. It's sort of like when the union was there, I mean, when we had the strike, the, uh, my management didn't like it, my board didn't like it, politicians didn't like it, the local community didn't like it, but I said, we've got to get through there. Uh, now, I created that mess. Um, but the market just reflected our underperformance, and uh, 
I don't know. I, I've invested 220 million after-tax dollars in in these two companies, um, and I just think there's some assets there. It's uh, I guess there are a couple of details that must have got slipped somewhere along the way, but I can see some sunshine now, and we're we're running. And also, the market was moving all over the place in that period. Um, and it's been down for three, almost three and a half years now. Yeah, I mean, sadly, the whole market was moving down and uh, hurt a lot of people. So I'd be remiss at the last question to ask you about what you see in the sector and the things going forward. But McEwen Mining owns 51% of McEwen Copper, correct? Uh, 48 now. 48, uh, okay. So I basically, God, so half, half or so of McEwen Copper. So you've had... Multiple investment rounds led by Rio Tinto and Stellantis, and the share price has essentially gone up from when we put money in in 21 to $10 to recently, the most recent round at 26. The valuation of this uh, fully diluted has gone from 257 million to 800 million. Now, you're talking US dollars there too, correct? Of course. Yes. yes. So you've got uh, an $800 million, call it private that company valuation, even though it's in a public vehicle, that McEwen Mining owns half of. Yet McEwen Mining has a approximately, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, as of yesterday's close, about yes. a $320 million US market cap, which means that we are sitting at a discount uh, with just the ownership, but I'm not looking at what your debt is on the balance sheet of McEwen Mining and your cash. So I'm not exactly sure what the enterprise value is, but I'm guessing it, it's at least one to one there, which would indicate like, even if you were sitting on net 60, there's 80 million in debt, you're talking about a $400 million enterprise value, which is half of what, you know, which is basically exactly what the ownership has been validated as, as being in McGew and Copper, which means that you're getting zero value for your coal business, your mining business, which you have multiple operating mines. I know you as well in some side conversations, you probably got dozens if not more of interests in like exploration projects and things all over the world that you don't even get to talking about because you know you you have so many other assets that are of value what do you what do you what do you attribute to the value of your gold business and the other parts of the business like even if the copper asset stayed stagnant uh or you sold it or whatever it is McEwen mining literally right now is trading like you have nothing beyond that. And it's all we could buy it for free, essentially, in the market. Am I being uh, too excessive or is that correct? I'd say exactly the same thing. You get the copper and the gold assets are for free. And what does that look like, though? What is the value of those gold assets? What is it worth? At a minimum, equal to the copper. Yes. I agree with that exactly. statement. Yep. What do you see in the future here for the company and for you? Like, uh, is there a timeline that you will have that eventual exit? We have development projects in Timmins, um, which is, will st extend the life of that operation in a fairly aggressive exploration program on a satellite deposit. Uh, we have work that will be going on later this year in Mexico, bringing on stream um, an operation that has been um, it's just a new stage of mining gold and silver um, the, and then the copper um, is looking at driving towards a feasibility study um, in um, the first quarter of next year we have tw oh, 20 drills on site operating up there um, we, I think it's um, right now, as you said, it's $800 million valuation. Um, it's compared to two other copper assets in Argentina in the same province, uh, the Filo de Sol, which has had some spectacular drill holes, and Jose Maria, and they're both controlled by Lundin Mining. But we're at a lower altitude than either of those, which has it. The lower you are, the better it is, easier it is to work 
at altitude and, and productivity of machinery. We're closer to infrastructure, roads and highways, uh, roads and power grid. Um, we have a larger resource base, copper resource base, than either of them. Um, Philo has a market cap of approaching two billion. Um, Jose Maria was purchased for 485 million. Um, I think we've got quite a bit of room still. Um, I had a couple of years ago felt that McEwen Copper was a unicorn and would cross a billion dollar mark. Um, and I'm pretty confident we're going to hit that assuming the copper price is still in demand. There's a deficit there. Um, there are a lot of the majors that are looking for growth prospects and having, if you look at ours, we're the eighth or ninth largest undeveloped copper deposit in the world. But if you look at it, and we'd be one of the four largest not owned by a major. So um, I, I, th I think there's a lot of room in there. And, there, and there's been a, a positive trend in production at the gold assets. Production's going up and the costs are coming down somewhat. And we see more room in, in that area. So I like it. Uh, and you're right, I'm underwater and I have to get back there because I want to make a, uh, support a lot of areas that I think society needs, like regenerative medicine and stem cell research at our center, or architecture and leadership development amongst high school students. And there's just, there's a lot that Mother Nature has provided that can help uh, benefit society. I thought that I've heard uh, a lot of this man's story in the past. I've gotten to know and watched from a distance and then gotten to know him as an operator, as an investor, as a businessman, as a person, uh, probably over the course of almost the last two decades. and. In this interview today, I was absolutely astonished. I don't know how many times I said the word wow. When he was just giving more details, I think he pulled the veil back a little bit more on some of the things that occurred in his earlier days of what was forming Gold Corp Corporation, which has notoriously been one of the largest value creators in gold mining history for uh, wealth creators, for investors. I believe that, you know, Rob had turned in a $50 million closed end ETF in the 1980s over two decades into an $8 billion gold producing behemoth that he eventually divested uh, and moved on to what he does now, which is McGew and mining. But the annual, uh, the compound annual growth rate for investors uh, was world-class during his tenure. and But what we didn't hear about, I don't believe in the past, are some of the stories of what it took in terms of things like battling a union that had been in place in this Red Lake district of Ontario, Canada, that essentially, uh, you know, this had been in place for four, four decades and he took them on and literally went through everything from death threats uh, to an extraordinary breakthrough of something that I believe ended up creating more positivity and goodness for everybody involved, even including people that were working in the mine, in the town, uh, and anybody around there, definitely the investors, and have actually seen him and heard about some of the things that he did uh, that I think was developing Bitcoin and Ethereum before they even came around for doing it in the gold business, starting an open source um, project to give everybody in the world the data they had on the Red Lake project and essentially ask them where do we find the next high grade gold and grow this gold mine and it turned into an incredible uh, story of value creation and so I'm super excited to share that with you today uh, with what we had with Rob it was incredible. Mm -hmm.